So it's a pleasure to be here and to be a co-sponsor of this conference. And um, I'm here representing the Gunderson residents of Mount Pine Hospital. Um, we're located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we're a residential treatment program for women with borderline personality disorder and other complex personality disorders, as well as not just limited to BPD. Um, we are a self-funded program that has a minimum stay of two months, and we offer a highly structured individualized treatment plan that's um, in a comfortable, supportive setting. Thank you. Um, and what we do is we try to help people develop self-reliance, independence, and optimal functioning. We structure our treatment using both biological behavior therapy and mentalization-based therapy, and we also create individualized treatment plans for co-occurring disorders like depression, anxiety, PTSD, substance abuse, and a variety of self-harming behaviors. Um, the Gunderson residence is only one of the options at McLean Hospital in our continuum of care for borderline services. We have a similar residence for teenagers up to the age of 20, starting as early as 13, called 3 East, as well as an, 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 uh, options for outpatient services, which I'd be more than happy to tell you about. Thank you very much, Dr. Photos. Uh, next, um, I'm, I'd like to invite up uh, Michael Roy. Uh, Michael Roy is the founder and executive director of Clearview Treatment Programs. Uh, so hopefully, uh, some of you have had, I know, have had a chance to chat with him. Uh, and here he is now. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Michael Roy, uh, executive director of Clearview Treatment Programs. First, I just want to thank um, NEABP and Gail, Seth, and Perry for putting on this great conference and welcome to all of you. Um, so just a little bit about Clearview. Clearview is one of the few programs along with the other um, co-sponsors uh, that specializes in DPD. We're located in Los Angeles. Uh, we offer intensive DBT programs for women, including a, a residential program, a transitional living program uh, where they can live and, and engage in the community uh, along with day treatment and then we have a standalone day treatment program so they can live in their own apartment or live locally um, and uh, participate in a very intensive six to eight hour a day, five day a week EBT program and then we also have a standard outpatient EBT program. Uh, all the therapists are intensively trained in EBT. Um, we also focus on really helping them to get back into life and reintegration, um, which is something that um, really tends to be a struggle with uh, people with BPD. Um, women can start at any level of care. They don't have to enter at residential. They can start at any level. Um, we also focus on uh, all the co-occurring diagnoses, substance abuse, eating disorders, depression, so on and so forth. Um, we also offer, uh, we have some of our staff that have been trained in family connections with she was developed by NEABPD, so we offer family connection classes uh, a few times a year. Um, we're also doing a, a series of workshops for professionals and, uh, and family members and consumers. Um, Charlie Swenson, who some of you may know, is actually doing a, a workshop with us uh, in July. Um, and, um, again, thank you all for coming, and we have a, an exhibit uh, in the back on the right if you'd like to stop by and say hi. I feel uh, extremely privileged to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Mary Lisa Johnson. Dr. Johnson is an associate professor and director of uh, women's and gender studies at the University of South Carolina Upstate. She's the author of several books on feminist cultural studies, as well as a memoir of her personal struggles with borderline personality disorder. Her bravery in telling her story provides a tremendous contribution toward changing the stereotypes and stigma of BPD. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. Mary Lisa Johnson. Hello, and thanks for being here. Uh, I am super nervous, but that will go away as I'm in the process. And sometimes if I just say that up front, it goes away even quicker. Uh, thank you especially to Seth Axelrod for inviting me 
and to Joan Kricka for assisting in all the travel arrangements to get me here. The trip has been flawless, and that's very important to someone with anxiety disorders. I do want to give a trigger warning. There are a couple of references to cutting, so if you want to just pretend like you're going to the bathroom sometime in the next few minutes, we'll all collude in that line with you um, to avoid any possible triggering. You are not borderline. So said Marge, my marriage counselor, in one of the, our first sessions just before my book on being or having borderline personality disorder was scheduled to come out. I have put my fist through a window of my beloved 1924 Craftsman bungalow during an argument with my spouse, and we decided we needed help. A borderline, Marge continued, will cut your throat and watch you bleed out on the floor. In a conference on hostility, impulsivity, and legal involvement, I think it's important to distinguish between Marge's misconceptions of borderline violence and the lived realities of hostility among what we might call high-functioning borderlines. And these would include sadistic verbal attacks, violent obsessive imagery, relationship control phobia, and occasionally punching a window out to say, this is what I'm willing to do to be heard by you. Although the distinction between high-functioning and low-functioning borderlines is a comforting idea to me, the line may not be as stable and definite as we would like to think. It may not be so much about the factor of impulse control as it is about the matter of witnesses. Who sees you in the moments of discontrol? And about the matter of consequences, what unforeseen things come to pass as a result of what would otherwise be momentary outbursts? In writing my story in Girl in Need of a Tourniquet about an affair that literally drove me crazy, I incorporated narratives about other women and one man whose meltdowns were significantly more high profile in order to resist the false lines between high functioning and low functioning and between sane and insane because their stories felt really familiar to me. My goal was to intervene in the cultural trend of presenting their actions as incomprehensible. Self-defeating, yes. Socially unacceptable, yes but not impossible to understand. Emily and I are sitting in her living room, the least well-heated room in her house, and my hands are cold. I tuck them between my knees. Emily says, you're not in touch with any of your exes? I say no and feel vaguely ashamed, like she's giving me a psychological test and I'm failing. I refill my wine glass and try to explain. Less than one year later, Emily and I are ensnared in an all consuming <coughs> affair with each other, flying in the face of her monogamous relationship of 12 years with a woman named Vanessa, risking our relationship as co-workers and friends, and the affair capsizes on the rocks and shoals of our separate needs. I need to talk to her. My life depends on it. She tells me that won't be possible. I need space, she says. I respond to the flat line of her voice by turning up the volume on my end of the conversation. As if the contest of need requires a specific number of decibels, and I have to make up for her deficit by making my own emotions louder. So I let rip with a primal scream, you want space? You want space? You got it. And I throw my phone at the wall, I cry, I scream again, I shake. I slam the kitchen cabinet door shut 20 times in a row. I clutch myself hard enough to leave bruises, drag my fingernails down the backs of my arms. I sit on the brand new Berber carpet in a room I keep neat as a pin, and I carve Emily's initials into my ankle, angled lines, making rough letters like a child might draw. I think to myself, I never want to see her again. I clutch my foot and watch the letters beat up with blood. God, I hope I know how to do this part. No, that's not it. How do I make it go forward? Is that Axel Rod? <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> In January 2009, 
Time Magazine published a story titled The Mystery of Borderline Personality Disorder. <coughs> the author genuinely intends to destigmatize the disorder, but he still seems perplexed by it. The mystery that goes unresolved is the idea that borderlines, quote, are capable of deep love and profound rage almost simultaneously. That borderlines, quote, are powerfully connected to the people close to them, yet attack those people unexpectedly. And, quote, when they want to hold, they claw instead. Looking at the illustration selected for the article, which is the very top image on the slide, it seems to me that the mystery in question is, which face is the person with BPD going to show me today? The image and the question and the puzzle of wanting to hold but calling instead all betray the limitations of the view of the borderline from the outside. There is a piece of logic missing here. In doing my initial research on BPD when I first got the diagnosis in 2005, I had the same reaction to the popular book, I Hate You, Don't Leave Me, Understanding Borderline Personality, which you see over there on the end. The title, and certainly the book has many valuable things inside it. I don't dismiss the book, but I want to just describe to you some of the uh, frustrations that I have with the catchphrases attached to the disorder. The title mobilizes a similar sense of mystery and obstinacy, as if the borderline personality simply doesn't make sense, and maybe doesn't want to. Popular films fill this blank space with visions of extreme violence. Think play Misty for Me, Fatal Attraction, one I didn't include but thought of uh, along the same lines, Single, White Female. Um, and I believe that they use these images of extreme violence to express what the non-borderline feels when confronted by the borderline. Anxiety, frustration, sometimes terror. But it leaves the lived experience of the person with BPD unmapped. Even saying the person with BPD is mercurial, as Theodore Milan does, and again, love his work, that phrase bothers me. Uh, so even that word retains the limited view from the outside of the borderline personality as unpredictable <coughs> and unfathomable. Feminist scholars actually make a similar misstep, forwarding conversations about BPD by suggesting the diagnosis and condition are not real. I align myself with feminist disability studies scholars who wish to validate the realities of invisible disabilities, as Andrea Nicky calls them, and chronic illness, as Susan Wendell describes it. So I'm using those images about other disabilities to explore borderline personality disorder from this feminist disability studies angle. So to validate this, the realities of invisible disabilities and chronic illness in women's lives by announcing that the mad woman in the attic is real, her madness is real, and I am, in fact, that mad woman. Like those t-shirts that say, this is what a feminist looks like. I often fantasize about making a t-shirt that says, this is what crazy looks like. <laughs> this is what I mean by the gesture of my title moving toward a feminist phenomenology of borderline personality disorder, speaking from inside the opaque moment of BPD cognition that hovers unspoken between hate you and don't leave, between wants to hold and claws instead. At the height of my affair with Emily, or we might say my despair with Emily, I drive the narrow circle from home to campus to therapy and home again, singing angry songs and picturing myself punching the glass of my windshield. I want to watch the barrier crack from the force of my fist, like a cement sidewalk giving way to the reckless desperation of dandelions. I want to see my anger as the poetry of a flower etched in glass. I want the delusion of falling apart that looks like a dying swan or a swirl of yellow leaves in the brilliant harvest season. It would be more accurate to admit that anger is a stone thrown through the antique stained glass windows of a church. The anger is a drunkard singing lewd songs at a funeral. The anger is an addict putting a knife into your liver before taking $10 from your wallet for a fix. The anger is bold and destructive and frightening and not at all beautiful. I'm having visions of entrails and blood splatter patterns. I am beginning to scare myself. I don't want you to take this literally, I say to my therapist, Paula. 
I edge slowly into the territory that could be interpreted as psychotic. I don't want you to put me in the hospital for this, I say, and she nods. These words keep running through my head like a mantra. They're not words I want to act on, but whenever I feel frustrated or shut out from life with Emily, I think these words over and over. I'm stalling. What are they? I want to be bloody. I watch her face closely. I want to be out of here. I'm relieved when she does not look shocked. I picture blood running down my forearms, and then I picture getting the fuck out, just being gone. This is the only way I know to break free of this wild loop of grief. What that sounds like to me, she says, is a fantasy of purging. I don't tell her the other part, the awful image of bashing Emily's head in. I could kill her. I would be free then. Maybe that's what my life story is, I think. A woman who landed in jail for killing the lover who would not be hers alone. The logic of the crime of passion fashions my longing for Emily into a lethal weapon. Like a wailing infant, I want to annihilate the source of my frustration. Funny story, a female astronaut in dark wig and trench coat confronts a woman in an airport parking lot in Orlando for threatening to steal her boyfriend. Police discover a steel mallet, four-inch knife, BB gun, and a bunch of large trash bags in her truck. I don't blink an eye at Lisa Nowak's public breakdown. Of course she drove 14 hours straight through the night to meet her love rival in an airport and maybe kill her or maybe just scare her. Of course she wore a diaper so she wouldn't have to stop the car. <laughs> People magazine ran the story of this love triangle into the headline, Out of this world! But that's hardly the case, and I suspect the people that people know this. By the time Paula proposes borderline personality as a possible diagnosis for me, I am fluctuating between levels two and three on John Gunderson's list of three levels of emotional functioning and borderline personality. Level one is depressed, bored, and lonely. That's familiar. Level two is angry, controlling, paranoid, and manipulative behaviors in response to anticipated loss of attachment. Check, 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 definitely yes. Level three, uh, and this is when it began to get scary for me, is nihilistic dissociation, raging fights, often fueled by the disinhibiting effects of alcohol or substance abuse. I slip in and out of secret psychosis like a second skin. The airless cockpit of the mood astronaut begins to feel like home. Like many people in therapy, I want too much and too little. I want to be better right now. I better be right all the time. I want to skate scot-free. I scoot on my tail when the slope gets too steep. I want the card that says get out of jail free. I want to be free to be you and me. I respond to the diagnosis like rocket fuel is sending me fast through the rough friction of borderline psychopathology, red zone, recalcitrant, recalcitrant, ballistic. I cut more, I drink more, I cry more, I sleep with more of the wrong people. In the following weeks, I conduct the business of being borderline as if it were the Challenger space disaster. I become Krista McAuliffe coming apart in the sky. One of the ways that Emily and I bonded at the very beginning of the affair was by talking about my childhood experiences of emotional and verbal abuse and the very poor fit between my mother and me. I shared stories designed to demonstrate my early feelings of monstrosity, hoping she might absolve me of them. And she did. I came to depend on her for this. When she would not or could not be there for me in this way, I raged at Emily. My rage was not about Emily. On our very first secret date, I tell her about the morning I noticed two bumps on the back of my head, one on the left side and one on the right, just near the base of my skull. My mother is histrionic and hypochondriac. She instilled in me an expectation of sudden catastrophe. Our bodies might sprout a fairy circle of tumors. Our bodies made a shiver in fear and disgust. We looked in the mirror and prepared ourselves to be horrified. I watched my mother stick long surgical <coughs> Q-tips inside her cesarean sutures to clean the wound when it wept and bled and split open. I walked into the kitchen one day and saw two bags hanging over the stove, dripping purple liquid into a pan. I worried her body had rejected her new silicone breast implants. But it was just grapes from our yard. She was making jelly. 
I saw a peach pit on the edge of the bathroom sink and recalled my mother digging under the skin of her face with a needle that morning. I worried she had pulled some piece of gore from her body. When I feel the two bumps on the back of my head, I think my body is revolting too. I show them to my mother and ask her what they are. Horns. <laughs> You're growing goat horns. That's me around that age. Um, I look like a nice kid who maybe likes herself, you know, feels pretty and proper and what have you, but the inner sense of badness that's going on underneath the surface is an interesting kind of example of perceptual distortion and borderline personality disorder. So this is when I began to, to understand myself as having goat horns growing from my head. I think about our own goat, Toro, and the way his horns grew from his head Little nubs, hard beneath the surface of his skin, just like mine. <laughs> Better watch out, she deadpans. They'll show through your hair soon. Five years passed before I realized she was lying or joking or whatever. I wait five years to be revealed part girl, <coughs> part girl. I spent my childhood in a state of chronic anxiety. I wrote love notes to each parent and from the time I could put words to paper, I packaged my affection with uncertainty. I love you, Linda. I like you. Do you love me? Do you like me, Linda? Yes, I know you do, Linda. I love you, Linda and Marty. I like you. Do you love me? Do you like me? Yes, I know you do, Linda and Marty. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, Mom. And do you love me? Children with insecure attachment styles become addicted to our own adrenaline. The memory of intense psychological arousal, I love you, do you love me, leaves us with a craving for powerful jolts, a new crush texts, a coworker loops a pinky finger over yours, the perfect fit as opiate and tourniquet, a gal could get hooked on this feeling. When the coworker, crush, secret lover, mother monstrosity absolver won't take your call because she's having dinner with her wife and child, which you mockingly and tearfully call family time, things can turn ugly. In the steaming heat of our first summer together but not together, Emily and I are fast storms and loud thunderclaps. We cannot give each other more than a day or two of peace at a time. We call and say mean things. I thought you loved me. You don't even know what that word means and we hang up on each other like 13-year-olds. I want Emily to acknowledge the choice she has made. She says I'm the one making the choice by insisting we are all or nothing. I wedge words like significant other and primary partner between her lips, but she spits them out unformed in my face. By the time winter rolls around, my anger is a block of ice inside me, and I begin to experiment with self-deprivation as a way of protesting Emily's intermittent availability. I think of it at the time as an act of sadness, but I will later realize the truth about eating disorders and cutting and alcoholism and the logic that structures every form of self-injury. Living in a house without heat is a sustained act of hostility. Not eating is a test of endurance. I can go without so many things, it seems to say. This wilderness skill keeps me safe. I short circuit my needs and diffuse other people's power over me. I want to defy trauma. I picture myself monstrous and strange like the day I climbed from the broken window of a wrecked car in shock, 16 years old bleeding from my torn cheek, coughing up glass on a sparkling asphalt. I must be frightening your children, I said to the woman who stopped her car to rescue me from the side of the road. Spring frosts with broken pink blossoms, and I have grown thin and pale and sick. We are 15 months into this thing. On the night I will later come to think of as the big cut, my mind is a tornado alley. Ella Fitzgerald says spring can really hang you up the most. Emily leaves this message for me in a note. I picture a noose. I picture my body as strange fruit. Abandonment depression steps to you sudden and mean, and when you have it, spring sounds nothing like the smooth plum silk of a jazz singer's throat. I'm with Jolie Holland on this one. She says springtime can kill you. 
Jolie lays down the promise of spring renewal like a coiled snake, a toothache, a promise your lover would not make and flat dares a girl to pick it back up. I take a blade from my bedside table drawer and set it down on the bedside table next to me. I sit and cry and rock like I am rocking a baby in my lap. She is inconsolable. I want to put the crying in a car. Sorry. This is a powerful moment to have a misstep in the read. I want to put the crying in a car and watch it roll into a lake. I put some music on and turn it loud as I feel inside. I push the blade back and forth across the thin skin of my wrist. I make one cut, then another right next to it, and then another, each time thinking just one more, but I don't stop. I line them up tightly, a series of straight red wounds, about two inches long, covering my forearm from wrist to inner elbow, and it's still not enough. I move the blade diagonally across uh, the, <clears throat> sorry, I move the blade diagonally across the forearm close to the wrist, <clears throat> carving a section of delicate cross hatchings that trail off at the curve of my arm, and then I push around to the more visible outer side. Yes, I think. Do it. Go crazy. I'm not afraid. Well, I've taken a dose of Xanax prescribed for stage fright. Instead of making me relax and fall asleep, it puts me in a trance. Books on pharmaceutical treatments for borderline personality generally blacklist Xanax. It reduces panic as we walk along the narrow canyon rim of self-annihilation. We stare with stone eyes at our own open skin. Eventually, I put the blade away and go calmly to bed. My arm burns all night long like I ran it under scalding water. I teach class in a sleeveless dress the next day. My face is calm, my smile earnest, the stripes on my arms like exclamation marks punctuating my lecture. Nice girl, responsible woman, nurturing teacher. The facades break apart. A mad woman bursts through the seams. I sit at a pub near campus and sip whiskey to kill time before therapy. My affair with Emily is an arena for tenderizing old pieces <coughs> of emotion to make them pliable enough to pass from my body. They mark my intestines with fissures and clog my elimination system. Instead of getting the old feelings out, I strain my abdomen and pass nothing but blood. The tantrum of the affair is triggered by a mass of displaced rage and guilt and shame about a childhood crime I committed but was never convicted of. I was 11 years old. I abandoned my sisters. Um, and to clarify that, I moved out when my father divorced my mother to save himself. I thought, I'm saving myself too. Um, so we left together. And that on the left is me at 11, right after I moved with my father. And then the two little ones are my younger sisters. The other two are cousins that are irrelevant to the story. Okay. So I had to do this. I had to save myself from my, my mother's abuse. And I trained myself to say it was okay. It was not okay. I became my own untrustworthy narrator. I told myself lies. I knew things I didn't want to know. I didn't want to know I wasn't okay. I didn't want to know I was a liar. I learned loss, orphan, amputee, lone wolf from a pack of three. My youngest sister, Melissa, was two the day I put her in a crib and walked my father out the door, walked with my father out the door forever. I was very close to her before I left. I fed her, bathed her, rocked her to sleep when she woke in the middle of the night. She was like a first child to me, even though she was born when I was nine. I really had primary caregiving duties, uh, got up with her in the middle of the night, and um, it, we were very attached. Well, she hardly knew me the first time we saw each other after I left. Just two weeks later, I reached for her, and she pulled back. Something inside me broke. Self-cutters often are seen as manipulative, histrionic. I want you to see something else behind the act, something intolerable in the psyche of the self-injurer. I want you to see the unspoken bereavement of becoming unsistered that left me clawing the carpet in agony 
because my stolen girlfriend would not come when called. The next day, after the big cut, I go to an emergency therapy session. Oh my God, what brought that on? Paula busies herself with papers on her desk and asks if it's the worst cutting episode I've ever had. Yes, I say, my eyes sting from self-deprivation. I am pitching a tantrum, I say. I want her to tell me how to stop. I wonder if she can tell I've been drinking. Are you ready for the hospital? She's trained to be blunt in confronting my borderline behavior with reminders of consequences, the scars, institutions, the stigma of madness. No, I say. Secretly, I wonder if maybe I really should be locked up. Maybe this is crazy. Maybe I'm already there and just don't know it. That would be crazy. I think of giving in. I picture nurses and pills and cinder block walls. I imagine lining up behind other crazy girls waiting for food and medication and therapy. I think of letting myself go under. But I'm not ready. Not yet, I say. Well, I didn't end up in a psychiatric facility or a prison. But Melissa, on the other hand, is currently in jail for trafficking meth. She got 10 years. She will do at least four. The sentence started this spring. The mystery of borderline personality disorder to revisit the Time magazine story is the fact that I'm standing here talking to you today, doing my work, despite the fact of all of these shenanigans, while Melissa is doing time in the Lee Arendale State Prison in Georgia. There are reasons for emotional dysregulation. There are reasons for drinking and cutting, for smoking meth and lighting fires. There is a story that makes sense of all of this. Nerve damage and nightmare, nostalgia. The borderline digs with razor blades, glass slivers, toenail clippers, her own rough nails. Even she is hard pressed to put a finger on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. What I'm going to suggest, rather than do questions, is um, Dr. Johnson invited, if people have questions or have comments they wish to make, to post them on her blog. Also, Dr. Johnson will be with us through the day, and she's invited people, if people care to approach her, ask questions, um, please do so. And actually, if you want to write them on the lovely little green cards, I'll take them home and blog my responses right away. That's right. Thank you. Thanks Thank you so much. Our next presenter is, um, is someone who has encountered borderline personality disorder as a parent, an advocate, an educator, and most recently as a mental health professional. Marie Paul de Valdivia is a board member of National Education Alliance for BPD, and she's been instrumental in increasing access for family members to the, to the empirically supported NEA BPD Family Connections Program by offering their program uh, to groups of families by telephone. She's about a week away from graduating with her Master's in Social Work from the Southern Connecticut State University, and I've been extremely fortunate to have her working with me this past year in the Adult DBT Intensive Outpatient Program at Yellow Maven Psychiatric Hospital. Please welcome Marie Paul de Valdivia. Okay, and you can use the 
Americans <coughs> for. There you go. You can be there. Mary Lisa has such suffering. Thank you for your courage in sharing this with this audience today. It's very touching to hear you speak in this way, and it is, you're right, it is such a mystery. By way of intro, I'll give you a little bit about our family's journey, and I'm on the other side of that. I'm the mom. And it was five years ago that our family was hit with, um, with our daughter's illness. We didn't really see it coming. She was hard to raise, but it really came to us full force. And this is a pretty accurate picture of what that felt like for us when her illness just came out. It's really impossible to convey to you the sense of hopelessness that as a family we felt when this all came crashing down on us. It was really profound sadness at the promise of somebody who was very talented, very bright, and who apparently at that moment, they didn't know any better, appeared to be lost. There was an intense fear at the incredibly self-destructive, dangerous behaviors, the substance use, and the hardest of all, really, for parents, was the chaos that we felt. The sense, oh, you can't hear me, sorry. The sense that, as, <coughs> that, nothing, that nothing made sense. The feeling that whatever we did was chaotic, it resulted in some chaotic behaviors, and that um, and that whatever we did resulted in things that were unexpected, more raging, less raging. And then, perhaps worst of all for a parent, the sense that perhaps we had something to do with it, except we didn't know why. So our daughter had suffered, perhaps in the way that was just described so touch touchingly, for about two years. And she was hitting a really rough patch when I went online and found a website, the website of a psychiatric hospital residential treatment program that described borderline personality disorder. And I had never heard of it before. And when I saw it, everything suddenly started to make a whole lot of sense. She went there. And then four weeks later, she did something that she had sworn she would never do that she hadn't done for a couple of years, she came home. There was still a lot to do, but this was her first step in the direction of recovery. <coughs> it was also my first step in a parallel journey of change. My husband and I at that time took a class <coughs> in which we learned what I'm going to take you through. This class was masterfully developed by Alan Fusetti and by Perry Hoffman, president of National Education Alliance, who you heard earlier today. Alan Fusetti wrote a book called The High Conflict Couple, fabulous book, it talks about relationships in families. Um, and that class that I took then is organized in a 12-week format. Um, it is led by sometimes professionals, most often family members, and it is completely based and founded on the DBT principles of acceptance and mindfulness. In this presentation, you will see a lot of quotes from people who have taken the class. I have since trained to become a family leader, a family class leader, and I have taught, I don't know, over 100 families or so over time. And here is one such quote, and I'm not going to read them to you. I'll let you read it. Um, what is challenging in that class is that the skills that <coughs> many family members need to learn are both incredibly simple in many ways and very, very hard to implement. Change is hard. And we know how to be parents. And one thing that parents need to hear, especially parents who only have one child who has the symptoms of this illness, is that our parenting styles work with our other children. We're good parents. It's just our parenting style doesn't work with that child who has special needs. So it is really hard to implement, to basically reframe parenting from what we used to do to what we need to do. So the way we do this, 
12 evenings. At any moment in those 12 weeks of classes, they take about two hours each, um, we do one of three things. We either educate, it's sort of like bpddemystified.com, right? Um, it's, uh, and, and it's interesting, in three years, things have changed a great, great deal. The, the landscape has changed. It used to be that three years ago when I first started teaching this class, many people just didn't even know the symptoms of borderline, much less the etiology or the various treatment uh, modalities. That has changed enormously, but it presents a different challenge, which is that people's perceptions can be misaligned sometimes. So we, in the education part, we straighten things up a little bit. Um, skills is central to the class. Not only do we try to teach skills, um, some of the skills that our relatives learn when they are lucky enough to be in DBT treatment, but we also encourage generalization of skills. So there's a lot of talk about homework, and it's hard because most families who come to those classes come in states of crisis, and in the middle of a crisis with your relative, it's really hard to sort of take a breath and think about the homework that you want to do or have to do. Um, but we encourage that and we check on it the next class in order to start to effect the change that is so necessary. And then, um, and then the third aspect is support. And support is, is absolutely essential because not only do families suddenly start to hear from one another the feelings that they've had all along, um, the level of invalidation for family members is huge. They hear everything and the opposite. You should be tougher. You should be kinder. You should put her in residential. You should keep her at home. You know, the, the, the uh, challenge in making sense out of all of that out there is really, really tough. When people find themselves with people who are going through the same thing, the, the sense of relief is literally palpable. The support is not just in the first class when everybody needs that. It's also in, um, in the next classes when, um, um, when people try out skills and fail, because the first time it's easy to fail, but are proud that they tried, and recount that to others. And then other members of the group sort of think, well, wait a second, if she could do this, then maybe I can do it too. And then the first success, which comes usually around class three or four, is like, you know, a common success. Everybody's like rooting for everybody else, and that's when the change starts to, to take place. So support, very, very important. First module is key. Well, the first module, the first class, it really is everybody meeting up and, and introducing themselves. But the first module is getting started skills. And the reason why we start with that is because, as I said, most family members are in crisis when they come and they need something to hang on to. So, the, um, so, so a lot of the, the, the getting started skills have to do with reassurance. <coughs> you will learn to say no and to not be made to pay for it. We will teach you this. It's okay. You are not responsible for your relative's problems. It's okay that you will get angry at times. Who would not? So there's a lot of reassurance there. But there's also a few first pointers. Um, one of them that is absolutely key is to interpret things in the most benign way possible. We have a really bad word in those classes. It's the, we call it the N word for manipulation. We try to root out a sense that we are being manipulated or that our relatives are trying to manipulate. We try to develop compassion and empathy. Manipulation has very little to do with any of this. So, in one of my very first classes, there was a wonderful lady who was in a state of crisis and who was exhausted by her um, adult daughter's antics, and um, who came back at the next class after this. And, you know, by, by most people's standards in the group, maybe she was the most fragile of all of us. But she came back session three, and she said, you know, I've been chanting that benign mantra in my mind. I've been saying benign, 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 and it worked. And everybody else in the group was just so joyful to see that just that had given her a little bit of a freedom and release, and everybody else started chanting the benign mantra, and that was very helpful. 
We introduced the concept of dialectic with the concept of there is not just one or an absolute truth. There can be two of you that are both representative of the truth. And the challenge is not to hang on to our side, but to find a synthesis between the two. So we started to talk about that. And a lot of it get, you know, seeps in in the first session, but a lot of it will come back again in the next modules. The class is not, you know, you learn from A and you end at Z. The class is more of a spiral and we go over the uh, concepts and the skills again and again from different perspectives, and that's really helpful. And then finally, and that leads into the next module, the last two go together, really. Everyone is doing the best that they can in this moment. In other words, the best that they can, the best that your child or your spouse can in that moment may be pretty nasty, it may be pretty bad, but if they could do better, they would. Similarly, with relatives, with parents, we are doing the best that we can, and we're here to learn to do better. I should have said, and this is key, and we have to repeat it many times, that the class is really um, aimed at relieving the relative's sense of stress and difficulty. We are not taking a class in order to help our relatives get better. It now happens that when people take the class and do well in the class, it ends up having a great deal of positive effects on our relatives. But the key purpose of the class is for relatives. The next module goes into developing interest and curiosity. So we have a bunch of parents who come and who are rightly extremely angry at what is going on. They don't understand it. They're overwhelmed by it. There's a sense of anger, hopelessness, much like I described happened to us, right? The concept of developing empathy, curiosity, is almost the opposite of anger and judgment, right? So we develop this curiosity and this empathy by describing what the illness is, by trying to give a sense of the suffering of our relatives. Now, all of these people, they wouldn't be taking the class if they were not good parents. All of these people really, really love their relatives. And they want to help them. And they want to help themselves. So there is an understanding of the illness that, that helps them a great, great deal. And then, in order to further the sense of empathy, we expose um, parents to the concept of sensitivity, reactivity, and return to baseline which are the hallmarks of severe emotional dysregulation. So people who are extremely sensitive, easily reactive, and take a long time to return to baseline. And then we ask parents or you know, relatives in the <coughs> to start to think of themselves in that way. How reactive are you? How sensitive are you? And how quickly do you return to baseline? And oftentimes, people are shocked. They're like, oh my gosh. Yeah, me too. I have at least two of those three, or I have a little bit of all three. So now the compassion and the empathy starts to um, starts to be created. We talk a lot about the biosocial environment. We'll talk more later on about how to be motivated. But we talk about the fact that um, families can be deeply invalidating. Not that they want, to, but when the communication from any member of the family is what we call inaccurate, not representative of their feelings, well then of course the response is going to not match that. And that's invalidating. So we start to talk about that just to expose families <coughs> to that concept. Um, and then there's a very important um, and very validating point that, that we make, which is that the support of families for uh, relatives who are ill is invaluable. That there is research that actually proves that it is better that we stay, we family members stay the course and continue to be there in our relatives' lives, even though it's so so hard, because it does correlate with a lower rate of <coughs> rehospitalization. So for all these people who have been told so many times, send her away, put them in boarding school, whatever, there's firm data that oftentimes supplements what they thought. And, and what their intuition was, which is, no, no, keep them here, keep them with me. The um, all the work that we do on that last point, the emotion mindfulness, actually leads into something 
really important, which is relationship mindfulness. A lot of homework, a lot of role play goes around working on emotion, uh, on relationship mindfulness. And what that involves is, what we're asking parents to do is really, really hard. It is, for people who've never done it before, it's the idea of being completely mindful and aware at all moments of the transactional nature of the relationship, that anything I say will have an effect on you, and anything you respond to me will have an effect on me. And that the dance goes on. And to keep track of that at all times. Not only in terms of content, but also in terms of emotion in the communication. So you can imagine, especially in times of crisis, that's not happening. But in time, or at least at first. But in times of quiet and peace, it can start. And when it starts, it takes on pretty quickly. But so that, that's where a lot of the comes in. Um, we then move into, well, we do talk a lot about, about um, what our values are as parents. You know, as parents, we have a role, and the role is to teach our kids right from wrong. In order to teach our kids right from wrong, well, we have to know what's right. And so we get very attached to what's right. No, 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 you can't steal. You can't steal. You go give this back, or you go pay for it, and I'll be waiting for you back here. Right? I mean, that's what parents do. In this case, we have to change it a little bit. We have to think about whether we want to be right, or whether we want to be effective. There may be different ways of teaching this and still do our job as parents, but do it in a way that is adapted to these, um, to, to, to those relatives, to our relatives. We move into radical acceptance, and radical acceptance uh, provokes a lot of conversation because um, it's hard for people to accept that their relative who often, and I mean it's just evidence-based from the people I've been working with, but um, oftentimes those uh, children had a lot of promise. And what parents have to accept is that, well, it's not going to look like what we thought it was going to look like. It's going to look different. Accepting is easy when it's pleasant. We call it radical when it's really hard. I mean, it's not hard to accept winning the lotto. It's hard to accept having a child. So radical acceptance involves not only saying, okay, here's my child, my child is suffering, or here's my spouse, my spouse has a hard time. But it involves really embracing it and saying, this is it, this is our life, and it can be a good life. It's leaving any sort of wishful thinking. So there's quite a bit of work that goes on around that as well. Limit setting. Um, for people here in the audience who work with families, this is perhaps the one area in which parents need most help. In the end, I mean, there's a lot of work that is involved in trying to understand what every person's limits are. We don't talk about boundaries because we don't want to make it firm. We don't want to say, this is it, and if you cross that boundary, then that's it, I'm not taking care of you. What we need to do as parents or as relatives is understand how far we can go where we can take it. So I'll give you a quick example. In my first group, where I was a student, um, there was an elderly woman who had taken a second mortgage on her home to help pay for her daughter's treatment. And I remember thinking, wow, I mean, that's amazing. How dedicated is she? By the time my daughter entered, um, entered the residential treatment program that I referred to earlier, we had used up her entire college savings account. It was, it was what was left in it. And I thought to myself, if this doesn't work, what do we do? Do I take my son's college account to help pay for her treatment? And you know, my answer was no. I wouldn't do that. That's my answer. It doesn't mean that there is no right answer or wrong answer. But the idea of coming to grips with your own limits and being told it's okay, being guided to find those limits and being told it's okay is really, really important and helpful. So the concept of, look, I wish I could do more, and it's all I can do, is something that we practice a lot. <coughs> and then we come towards the 
the end of the um, class, and we spent at least two sessions on validation skills. And the concept of validation, again, uh, many parents have misconceptions about that. They think it's complementing sometimes, or they think it's just sort of approving. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not that. Validation means understanding really profoundly what the other person's experience is in that moment and communicating that you understand it. It generally starts with something like, fair enough, or of course you would do this. It doesn't mean you accept. It doesn't mean you even approve. You can say, of course you would do this, considering the situation. So I'll give you a quick example. Um, I had some parents in my class one time who, um, at the start of the class, expressed a great deal of anxiety because they had been heard from their daughter, who lived independently from them in Boston, who was in treatment in Boston. They lived in Florida, and they hadn't heard from her. And once a week, they had a phone session with her, her therapist, and then they were on the phone with, with the therapist and their daughter. And the, ther the daughter hadn't shown up at the session. So they were quite worried. Well, next week comes along, and now they're, you know, bordering on panic because they've not heard from their daughter at all in two weeks. They've tried to reach people. They've called people in the building, and, you know, she's basically, she seems to be missing in action. So they're thinking about going up to Boston and, and really thinking through their options there. And um, the day after that second call, we were all worried. We had to wait a week to find out what happened. But um, the day after the second, um, the second meeting, it turns out that they received a phone call from their daughter, who didn't realize how panicked everybody was, and who had chosen to not go to her therapist because a liquor store had opened its doors on the way from her apartment building to the therapist's office. Now, most of us would say, well, couldn't she take another? No, she couldn't. It was the best she could do. The best she could do was to avoid going past that stage. She just skipped on therapy. And she forgot to mention it to people. You know, there were all sorts of thoughts and judgments that went through her parents' minds and through our minds as she was doing this. But of course, you know, once we knew what was going on, we could say, well, of course you wouldn't want to go past that stage. It makes sense. Good for you. Next time, maybe call us. Let us know. You know, just so we don't worry so much. But it makes sense. That's validation. We talk a lot about the concept of validating an emotion. Emotions are never wrong, they just are. So if you see an emotion, the idea of validating the emotion. I think I've talked about that. So the big picture is that this class, again, is for relatives more than it is for our loved ones. What we try to do is instill the idea that with marginal change, you can block the spiral. Relatives can put a stop to the spiral of energy that often starts and erupts so quickly with the use of these skills. My observation is that, um, again and again, this is exactly what happens. After 12 weeks of skills, people are capable of interrupting the spiral, um, the spiral of anger. I'll give you those final uh, inner words. I think from my perspective, what is most helpful in this class, what, what really is magical in this class, is that parents who had so much so many questions about their ability to be good parents start to see that they can have some level of control, that they can have pride, that they can have hope, that they can be good parents, and that they can validate themselves, that they can say all of this and feel that they can make a difference. And so that's our landscape. It's not the lens today. It's not the landscape I had expected when our daughter was growing up. It's different, <coughs> it's a little messy, it's a bit thorny at times, but it's beautiful. It's full of hope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you very much for If you
would take a question. We would have time for at least one question if someone has, if someone wrote something down, we can take that. Otherwise, I know that uh, Marie Paul would be very happy to answer questions if you approach her uh, between our sessions. Uh, she'll also be here through the, through the day. Um, and I know how to find her, so you can always find her through me. Um, does anyone have any green cards? Uh, all right, then we're going to be taking a... Um, uh, thank